Hi, folks. Welcome. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Melissa McKenna, and I'm the Department Head for Adult Services up on the second floor. Um, so please let me know if you have any suggestions of other programs or things that you'd like to see here at the library. Uh, I just want to remind you that our other upcoming events are on our website, uh, tattle.org slash events. Uh, and please be sure to check out, we are, uh, are recording the webinar this evening. Um, so if you Excuse me, if you have other people who were not able to attend this evening, please invite them to go ahead and view the recording, which will be posted on the library's YouTube channel, uh, Tattle Not Just Books. So um, that's linked on our website too, if you need that. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Dan Wanshura and Patrick Shea from Points North podcast that is broadcast bi-weekly on Interlochen Public Radio and apparently other places uh, in up north land. Um, and they're here to present uh, Unnatural Selection, um, which is uh, their series that they've done about the impact of humans on our natural world and environment. So please welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. Um, we're, we're excited to to chat a little bit about what we've been working on lately with with points north in this um this past year um but yeah thanks for thanks for being being here and uh coming out tonight um again i'm dan wanchura this is patrick shea we um, make up most of the team of of points north um and so i guess i would start by just saying points north has has taken on a variety of forms over the years um it's it's been in existence for quite a while used to be a, a live call-in show, but lately it's morphed into um, a show that deals with land, water, and inhabitants of the Upper Great Lakes. And sort of that's where our focus is. And um, the things we're looking for in stories, um, we're looking for narrative stories, um, stories that um, have uh, tension in them, or tend to make for, for good stories. So narrative stories that inform entertain and ultimately connect people to this this region so that's what we're we're shooting for in in points north we recently um completed a a season a special season of points north and this was something pretty new for us to to try so unnatural selection uh again as melissa referred to it it takes a look at the human impact um our management decisions in the natural world and so i'm going to play a quick trailer and then Patrick's gonna pick it up from there. So enjoy this trailer. We are obliged to be good stewards of the earth because the earth has been good steward for us. Humans have shaped and manipulated the natural worlds like no other species on earth. We've kind of developed this idea that we can engineer our way out of any problem. And those alterations have helped the planet. Are gray wolves endangered? No. They've also heard it. When I first came here, there was some pictures of the soil over there, some over there, and now it's gone. But we're slow to realize how our own environmental management affects the natural world. We as humans want to have quick answers. I'm Dan Wanshura. And I'm Morgan Springer. This February, we present a special season of Points North. It's called Unnatural Selection, all about the benefits and pitfalls of tinkering with our environment. You'll hear about unleashing foreign bugs to control other foreign plants. This looks black to me, mm -hmm. so it looks like grass. So there was bug poop. bug poop. We try to stop erosion on the Great Lakes, but our short-term fixes make long-term problems. People have to get used to the idea that a lake is going to Wait in the end. We'll debate hunting gray wolves and deer, genetic mapping, dams and fish, and false ideas about wilderness. Seven episodes coming to you. Subscribe to Points North wherever you get your podcasts. So, yeah, as Dan mentioned, this was a seven part series that we did. It finished up last spring. Um, I'm Patrick Shea. I've been at Interlock and Public Radio for about a year as a reporter. And about a year ago from right now, we got together and said we want to do 
a series, some, something with a common theme. And we all brought ideas to the table. And um, I have a background in natural resource work and in environmental science. And there are some, some big questions that I would always, had always wondered. And I kind of brought those before the team and we narrowed it down to two guiding questions that we all had some really cool story ideas that kind of fit under that under that theme. So those two guiding questions that we landed on that we wanted to not necessarily answer, but explore in our series were, first, are we solving problems in the environment or making more? A lot of the work that you do in natural resource management are controlling invasive species and generally addressing problems that other natural resource managers kind of made in the past without knowing. So we want to know how, how we know when we're just making more problems or actually presenting a solution. And the second question is, what's our role in the natural world? Where, where do humans fit into the ecosystem? And um, we'll get into that a little bit more as well. We're going to highlight two specific episodes and look at how they asked those questions and how it made for the kind of sound rich narrative stories that we were going for and give you a little bit of a behind the scenes look into how these episodes are made. So one question, one, one episode really touches heavily on the first question, which was an episode that Dan wrote and produced. It was episode two of the series and it was called Houses Built on Sand. And I'll let Dan take it for a while from here. All right, so yeah, um, I moved to, to Northern Michigan in 2015. And at that point, nobody was really talking about Great Lakes water levels. Um, about three years later, um, it started to be in the news quite a bit. Um, water levels were rising, 2018, 2019, 2020. We saw all sorts of monthly records broken on Lake Michigan. And so I, I really became interested in, in following that story. And um, you know, we covered everything from the destruction, the high waters were causing, um, sort of expediting erosion on the shoreline, putting people's homes in danger. Um, just the aftermath of, of what high water, the effect that high water caused in terms of, you know, it would, it would grab trees and pull them into the water. And then you'd have these huge trees floating around in the lake, washing up wherever on people's beaches. So we, we did some coverage on that. As the water level started to, started to go down, I just sort of thought like, hmm, I wonder what's next. Like, is this just sort of the, the, the cycle when the water levels get high, everybody panics and we, and we wonder what to do. But when they go back down low, we just don't out of sight, out of mind, and we don't think about it until the next time. So I was chatting with um, a, a, friend of, uh, a friend of mine, and he had this, this idea that really um, blew my mind. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna play a little bit of this episode, episode two, to, to best illustrate this idea. Thousands of years from now, Lake Michigan won't really be much of a lake anymore. Instead, it'll be more like a giant mark. Oh, okay. How does that happen? Okay, let me unpack this. The Great Lakes are cyclical, right? Sometimes the water levels are high, sometimes they're low. Most people living near the lakes know this. What many people might not realize, though, is the Great Lakes, over time, are also widening. What do you mean by widening? Well, the lakes are slowly getting larger because of erosion. Researchers say it's natural erosion, and it's been happening on all the Great Lakes since they were formed thousands of years ago. Take, for example, Lakes Michigan and Huron. On average, they're widening by about a foot every year. As erosion eats away the shoreline, the lakes slowly get larger. They're also getting shallower because, again, over many years, erosion pulls all that sand and sediment into the water. It's kind of like um, when you're at the beach and you dig a hole and then the sides cave in, so it gets wider, but if the sides cave in, they go into a little tunnel and it also gets shallower. Is that what we're talking about here on a much larger scale? Yeah, that's a pretty good example. It's, it's a moving landscape. It's changing constantly. So one of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately is how we build permanent things on this impermanent landscape. And today's story is about just that, about us continuing to build along the Great Lakes 
and the unintended consequences that come with it. So that's a little preview of episode two and that idea that the lakes are getting wider by a foot per year on average, like just totally blew my mind. I, I, I had never thought about that before. And it got me thinking about this, like what, what happens when we build on this movable landscape, this moving landscape, like what, what's the, the outcome? And uh, in many cases, the outcome is trying to, trying to harden up, harden the, hardening the shoreline, uh, building things like rock revetments and, and big seawalls. You can see that this was the solution that many people turned to. This is, these are numbers from the state of Michigan, um, uh, Great Lakes shoreline permits. So when you build a seawall or a rock revetment, you have to apply for a permit through the state. And this graph pretty accurately <laughs> illustrates the, just the urge, uh, the, the, the increase in demand for people as the water levels got higher, so did the demand for shoreline permits for all these um, seawalls and, and rock revetments. And you can see uh, down here, 2013, water levels were pretty low and steadily increasing, sh really shoots up in 2020, over 2,200 permits in Michigan alone, and then almost 1,000 in uh, 2021 as well. So the problem, you know, when, when the high waters come, it causes erosion and the, that erosion eats into people's property, endangers their homes. Um, and so the reaction is to build these structures, to harden up, to try to stabilize the land what you, that you have and try to protect your, your homes. But what I've learned and what this reporting uh, has, has told me was the land is is moving regardless. So any attempt to like harden it is ultimately not going to be a long term solution. So it, it was going to be a short term solution. So that was like my first sort of, oh, that's interesting. As I continued to report, um, I learned more about what these um, hardening structures do. So this is a rock revetment in Manistee. And you can see it's sort of like this giant jigsaw puzzle, all these huge boulders fit together. And uh, again, their intended purpose is to stabilize the bluff as, as waves come in that um, you know, they wouldn't eat away the bluff and, and destabilize it. And you can see from this photo, all that wave energy just sort of, you know, it's not absorbed by these rocks. It gets shoved back out into the water. And I learned uh, through a guy uh, named Guy Meadows. He's a researcher at Michigan Tech University just the, the impact that that wave energy causes. And so I'm gonna play a, a short bite from him. Guy Meadows has been studying this for a long time. He heads the Great Lakes Research Center at Michigan Technological University. Having hardened structures that are steeper than the slope of their natural reach all reflect waves back out to sea and those reflected waves interact with the incoming waves to produce more turbulence in the near shore zone and they drive sediment further offshore. All right, everybody get that. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of a lot, but basically what he's saying is when when the these waves um oops when these waves crash on this this structure, all it does is divert that wave energy to neighboring properties back out into the water. And that in reality causes more erosion for your neighbors. Um, and again, this was this was just fascinating to learn. And it caused me to think about this, this basic question of the series. Okay, if erosion is the problem and uh, like rock revetments or seawalls are the solution, but in reality, it's causing more erosion to neighboring properties and, and uh, not allowing the beach to do what it naturally does. Are we, are we solving problems or making more? This is another picture uh, from Manistee. This was taken in 2019. You can see a group of homeowners um, decided to put in a pretty dramatic rock revetment on their shoreline to try to stabilize that bluff from more erosion. And um, you can see, now, now I don't, you know, I, I can't claim that the destruction below that rock revetment is directly caused from it, but you can see sort of what Guy Meadows is talking about. If that, those waves come in, hit that rock revetment and then shoot up 
the shoreline to where there isn't a rock revetment, you can see the damage that it's going to cause. And that leads me to the sort of the final point of the episode, which is like, okay, what next? Like, what is the solution then? We have all these houses on, on the lakeshore. What is the solution then? And so I chatted with um, a, a University of Michigan professor. His name is um, Richard Norton. And this is uh, what Richard Norton suggested. Does that mean we shouldn't try? That we shouldn't even build near the shoreline? My inclination would be to say, let's figure out how to move back from the shoreline wherever we can. And, and then we'll then let's have conversations about who should pay for that and, and how we get there. And then only think about putting in permanent hardened armoring if there's some really compelling reason to do that in terms of the infrastructure that's there or the numbers of people affected for their shelter. So again, what he's what he's suggesting is like if you have a city on the water, maybe that should be approached a little differently than if you have homeowners on the lakeshore and, and the drastic measures needed to to just protect a home. And I want to be careful when I say just protect a home because hey, property owners, homeowners, you know, they they have their investments. And and I don't want to belittle that at all. Um, property rights are a are a big deal. Um, a lot of people think you know, you should be able to do whatever you want with on your property. That's sort of the, the tricky line that's at the, that's being balanced here is property owner rights, but also what's what's right and best for the lakeshore knowing what it naturally does. And so sort of taking all of those things into consideration, this professor is suggesting, you know, maybe we consider start moving homes back in some cases. I do know in some cases to move a property back, it's about the same price as putting in a rock revetment. So that's a possibility. Another thing he mentioned was we might build on the lakeshore. Maybe it's, it's changing the types of homes we build on the lakeshore. Maybe they're not multi-million dollar homes. Maybe they're, they're um, cabins and cottages that, you know, in 50 to 100 years, if the lakeshore continues to erode at a, at a similar rate, maybe it's time to say goodbye to that property and being okay with having a property that's maybe only going to serve you for a hundred years or so. But those are all sort of the issues that are wrestled with in this episode and uh, was really fascinating to report on. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to Patrick and he's going to talk a little bit more about the second uh, question in this series, which is uh, what's our role in the natural world? Yeah, and, and I, I think every episode has both of these questions in it to some degree, but one of my favorite episodes to report on that was the most interesting to me was episode five. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that. But again, I have a background in natural resource management. My first jobs in the summers in high school were pulling invasive species out of prairie preserves and things like that. And anyone who's worked in natural resources has probably spent a lot of time and agencies spend a lot of money dealing with invasive species that a lot of times were introduced on purpose for a reason that seemed to make sense at the time. And maybe it was a little short-sighted in our planning. I remember being in the truck with my first boss and he was telling, we were cutting and spraying autumn olive, which I know is a big problem here. And I asked him why it was introduced in our area. And he said that there was a time when people thought a lot of shrub species like that would be great habitat for small mammals and rabbits and things like that, a refuge for them. And they didn't foresee that it getting out of control and spreading everywhere. And I thought about that and said, so how do we know that the things we're doing now as natural resource managers aren't going to be problems that people have to deal with in 50 years? And he just kind of chuckled and said, I, I think we've got it figured out now. And uh, that wasn't a super satisfying answer to me at the time. I, I still really loved the work and it, and it felt good, but it was always in the back of my mind that what, what is our role? What impact are we supposed to have? Um, like you heard in the trailer, humans have an impact on the environment like no other species on earth, you know? Beavers have a pretty big impact too, but I think that we take the cake in, in that regard. Um, and so what is that role supposed to look like? I don't care what the History Channel says. I don't think we're aliens. Uh, and, and we're here. We're a part of this world. But what is our footprint supposed to look like? Um, I had those questions as I went on to study environmental science, but I never knew that I'd have a job where I get to ask those and, and tell these stories, which has been really fun. I went on to study forest ecology um, at Northland College, which is on the south shore of Lake Superior. That's when I really fell in love with the Great Lakes and probably what led me to this job eventually. But 
this is a pretty junior high level diagram of what we talk about a lot. These, these webs of life, these interconnected ecosystems where everything has a role and it's all tied together in this complex and beautiful web that's really fun to learn about. But as I went on in my schooling, I started to wonder, uh, something's kind of missing from this diagram. And I wonder if, if anyone can get, get what, I'm, what I'm hinting at here. What, what do you not see in this forest food web? People, right. Where do we fit into this? All of the stuff I was studying in ecology, in ecology was pretty apart from us. It didn't treat us like a part of these systems. And in the conservation movement in the United States, we had a trend of sort of looking at ourselves as detrimental um, to the environment. The, the pristine wilderness is one that we're not a part of. This is a picture from the Boundary Waters in Minnesota, which is where episode five, Rekindling Wilderness, takes place. Um, and that was one of the first wilderness areas established in the country. It came to be from the Wilderness Act of 1964. And in that legislation, it defines wilderness as places untrammeled by man, where man is just a visitor and does not remain. And I want to be clear, I think that having those kind of spaces are really important to get away from the hustle of life and get away from the sounds of the human environment. And a lot of people really appreciate that. But when we define our wilderness areas as a place where we kind of don't belong, where we're just a visitor, there's a lot of data coming out now from forest foresters and forest ecologists that kind of suggest otherwise, that that really isn't an accurate way to describe these landscapes. And that's what this episode was all about. So the field of research that I looked into for this story is called dendrochronology. That's a really big word, but when you break it down, dendro is Greek for trees and chronos or chronology means time. So dendrochronology is the study of time through trees. And the way you can do that is by, in, these are two specimens from the boundary waters that I looked at with researchers. These were dead and down red pine trees that they took cross cut saws and took out a section of. And when you do that, as you might know, each ring on this tree represents one season of growth, one year. So from the outside of the tree, they can count in and tell not only how old the tree is, but by the characteristics of those rings, they can tell what was going on at that time in history. Some, some details about the atmosphere, the climate, and disturbances that happened. So this tree on the right, like it was just really amazing for me to interact with these pieces of wood that are so old. The outside of that tree is when it fell, when it died, and they're counting back from that point. And it's kind of hard to see there, but a little bit in, there's a ring that says 1800, that's the year. And the middle of the tree is like the mid 1700s. Some of these tree specimens that we were looking at dated back to the late 1600s, way older than our country, and just really amazing what we can learn from these stories that are really held in, in the hearts of trees. Um, and what they were learning is a very specific kind of event they were looking for. So the prime, these researchers' area of interest, they were looking for trees with this on the front of it, and then look in the middle of it to tell something about I'm not going to tell you right away. I'm going to see if anyone can guess what a scar like that on the front of the tree might be from. Fire, right. So when a really young tree has a low intensity fire pass through that forest, it damages the outside bark. But if it's a low intensity fire, it's not hot enough to kill that seedling. And from then on in the tree's life, it puts out resin to cover that scar. And it kind of gives up on that section of wood on the tree and grows around it. So every year from then on, that part of the tree is kind of cut off from growth. And when another fire happens, it'll be indicated in the shape of the ring. It, it curves in towards that fire scar. Um, and when they looked at these tree rings, they were seeing in the boundary waters fires every four years or so in a lot of places. It would be counting back fire, 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 fire. And then they all stopped around 1890. No more fires. Um, lightning didn't stop. In 1890, lightning was still a part of that landscape. So what did stop? Um, I'm going to play a little clip uh, from this episode and then carry on in exploring that question. So I, I, I do think that all cultures have a relationship with the Some of us don't have that part of their back and our ancestral knowledge to my imagination. Our spirit, or I don't know whatever you want to call it, our life force is attracted to things that make us feel good. Mm -hmm. And the way 
So the person you heard talking there is Damon Panek, who's pictured above. He's a member of the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa in northern Wisconsin. And for many years, he was the prescribed fire manager for Apostle Islands National Lakeshore in Lake Superior. Um, and what's really in one interesting thing he said to me is that we're attracted as humans to things that we're familiar with. And that made me think a lot about who we are as a species and why we are all so drawn to fire. We like the sight of fire. We like watching the flames. We like the smells and the sounds. And fire is a familiar friend to us as a species. A lot of people credit fire for us becoming who we are in a lot of ways. The ability to cook food, keep predators away, and change the landscape by introducing fire to the land, which is what these researchers deemed was going on and also affirmed by the stories of indigenous people who remember these practices. Why would you burn the landscape? Well, one of the reasons you see blueberries pictured here, blueberries thrive on fire. Even at large blueberry farms in places like Maine, they'll burn every few years because the blueberries come back more abundant and stronger. They have a positive reaction to fire, as do red pines. So a red pine forest will change away to other species if there's not fire because it's a fire dependent species and a species that thrives with fire on the landscape. When you burn a forest like that, you're creating a habitat that benefits you. If you think about living in this environment, before natural gas heating, it's a cold place and you're gonna to wanna to create a cache of food for yourself in the winter. That means creating habitat where wildlife want to come so you can hunt them. It means creating lots of blueberries for harvesting and making various types of food with it. And that's an important cultural practice that a lot of people remember and hang on to in the upper Great Lakes. But the reason those fires stopped in the 1890s is that those practices were made illegal throughout much of the upper Great Lakes. There was a lot of concern for property damage from fire and a lot of concern about especially damage to timber resources and the value that they had in this area. And so if you were caught starting a prescribed fire at that time in many states, including Wisconsin, you could face five years in prison or a $5,000 fine, which in the 1890s that equates to a lot more money today. So that was a pretty significant deterrent for fire and caused these fires to stop in places like the Boundary Waters and the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore. And Damon started talking to elders in his community. So Red Cliff is north of Bayfield there near the tip of the Bayfield Peninsula. And this picture on the right is from Stockton Island um, in the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore. He started talking to elders in his community, asking them about their memories, their the stories they heard from their grandparents about the use of fire on the landscape. And they said Stockton Island was a place that was burned every three or four years to harvest blueberries. It was very abundant with blueberries. They would sell the blueberries to loggers and settlers. They would store them as food for themselves. And the result of that fire also created an ecosystem that's now really, really rare and unique and home to a lot of rare plants. And that ecosystem is a sort of red pine barrens on top of a sand dune. It only in, exists, sand, sand dunes habitat, it only exists in a few places and Stockton Island's one of them. Now that forest has started to change because there hasn't been fire in many decades. And the park service wants to keep that rare habitat around. And the Red Cliff Band of, of Chippewa wanted to keep blueberry harvesting a part of their cultural practices. So the federal government that used to illegalize fire worked with the Red Cliff Band to bring it back to the landscape. And in 2018, they had the first prescribed fire there for at least 70 years. And it's on a regular burn plan rotation now. And it's kind of a really, to me, a, a success story of listening to the people that live on the land and have these memories of management that made these the places that we see today. And the question I really ask in this story is, can we call these places wilderness if they really exist the way they are because of really significant human impact, which is the introduction of fire to the landscape? So you can listen to that episode, which is episode five, to hear more about how that burn went and the goals that people like Damon have for reintroducing fire as a part of the Great Lakes ecosystem. And again, it asks this question of what's our role in the ecosystem. I can't say what we're supposed to do or should be doing. But when you look at what our role as a species has been through history, fire is a really big part of it. And obviously, I'm a little biased towards fire. That's me facing away from the heat uh, at a wildfire when I was working at a prairie preserve in Illinois, where I grew up. And it's always a really familiar and, and good feeling to, to come back to an area that's burned and see how it comes back and see the diversity of, of life that fills in after. So that was probably my favorite episode to work on. And that's just a little more background 
about it. So those are two specific episodes we highlighted, but now we're going to kind of walk through what the seven part series covers if, if you hadn't haven't heard it. Um, episode one is about when our when our solutions to invasive species go wrong. So this is a weevil, the bug on the left. It was introduced to control invasive thistles that are a really big problem in agriculture and in parks. But what ended up happening in recent history is this weevil figured out it really likes to feed on the seed heads of pitcher's thistle, which is a rare native thistle that exists on the beaches here in Northern Michigan. Um, and it only seeds once in its life. So when a weevil gets in there and eats all the seeds, that's, that's a pretty big impact. So that kind of touches on that first question. Did our solution really just create more problems? That's episode one. Ping pong back and forth here. So episode two, which I already talked about, but I'm gonna go in just a little bit more uh, detail, I guess. Um, deals with this idea of building permanent things on a non-permanent landscape. I didn't mention in, in my uh, talk before, so there's uh, this photo is taken in Chickaming Township, Michigan. It's, it's Southern Michigan, right on the border with Indiana. And this township, um, after the residents and community saw this rock revetment go in, uh, you can understand they, they were pretty upset about it. Um, there's not much of a beach to walk anymore, which Chickaming Township has, I believe, seven miles of un uh, uninterrupted beach. A lot of people go there for beach walking and to enjoy Lake Michigan. You can see how this rock revetment changes the, the nature and the landscape of the beach. So they're actually the first, and to my knowledge, only community on the Great Lakes to ban hardening structures. So now uh, you, you couldn't build something like this there. Uh, they recognize the science of, you know what, these cause more erosion in the long run. It's a temporary solution. We got to figure out something else. And it, you know, changes the, the look of the beach. We got to figure out something else. So they have taken a, pr a pretty aggressive stance towards banning these, um, these hardening structures. And again, that's sort of set in episode two. Episode three touches on uh, gray wolves. Um, what's interesting in this episode, there's a, there's a DNR biologist who says, you know, science can tell us if we could manage wolves, so have a hunt, if we could hunt them, but science doesn't tell us if we should hunt them. And so this episode really gets into the human emotion of wolf management, of management of different species, but primarily wolf management. Um, and, and it just takes a look at how our feelings towards animals can impact how we manage them. Yeah, and I will say that that episode was uh, written and produced by Morgan Springer, who is also the editor of our series. Um, episode four is all about deer overbrowsing, um, overpopulations of deer and the impact that has on the forest around it. It takes a pretty local look at it, but expands it to the whole region. And that that local story is on North Manitou Island, where there's an introduced herd of deer that had a pretty major impact on the forest and on themselves in turn. That those those deer were introduced by residents in the 20s, and they, with no predators on the island and plenty of young trees to eat, they exploded in population, and then ate all the available food, starved, and died. And that cycle kind of is on repeat. And to try and end it damages the whole forest around it. So to try to control that, the park has an annual hunt on North Manitou. And I talked with some hunters who participated in that within that story. Um, and it really applies to the whole region. We have a big impact on deer populations, but not always in the ways that we think we do. It has a lot to do with the way we manage the landscape that creates these booms and busts. So to hear more about that, that's episode four. It's called Forest of the Living Dead. Um, episode five, I touched on a little bit, but really the the heart of well, quite a bit, but really the heart of the story is does wilder is is wilderness's definition as a place untouched by humans really accurate? And what is what is the data inside of trees tell us about that? And we'll take episode five here. Yeah. So this this episode was reported by Taylor Wisner, and it explores this idea. Um, you know, there's a movement today to restore rivers to their natural state. And that means removing a lot of dams from them. It's generally seen as a good thing by um, uh, a lot of environmentalists and, and a lot of people recognize the value in uh, dam removal. It allows native species, native fish to 
to move up and down the rivers freely. Um, but this episode uh, looks at the possible consequences of dam removal. Um, there's some uh, scientists and researchers in the episode who actually share that removing dams now could be a bad thing because it could allow invasive species like sea lamprey to move further uh, up, up river and uh, in get into areas that they haven't been able to yet penetrate. And so again, this series looks at the unintended consequences of uh, humans' decisions. And sometimes those unintended consequences can be good things too. So that's uh, episode six, Damned If We Do, Damned If We Don't. Yeah, and then uh, episode seven, I went, I, I was this close to failing genetics in college. So I really went way over my head in this episode, but it was amazing to revisit and I found myself super interested in it. Um, the, the question I asked, which is definitely forward looking and no one is trying this yet, but could and should genetic engineering help restore lake trout, which used to be the dominant predator in the Great Lakes? And no one has engineered some kind of super trout, but what has happened is a geneticist at Michigan State University last year uh, assembled the first ever reference genome for lake trout. And what that basically is, is a map of the species genetics. So that is now helping fisheries scientists to understand what genes in a lake trout are responsible for what specific traits. And there are certain strains of lake trout from some areas that seem to do a lot better at avoiding sea lamprey. And now we might be able to understand why that is. And the question I had is, well, then couldn't we breed lake trout in fisheries that are way better at avoiding that kind of predation? But should we do that? Should we meddle with the genetics of species that are in the Great Lakes? And I asked that question to a lot of fisheries managers. This picture is from the Jordan River State Fish Hatchery, where I talked to Roger Gordon who runs the fishery and encourages you all to visit, by the way, and is really friendly, and uh, share some really interesting thoughts on what we should and shouldn't do when it comes to genetic technologies, which are advancing fast, and I think these questions are going to become a reality. So that's episode seven, and it's called Frankenfish. Um, yeah. So to give you a, a little bit of a peek behind the scenes here, um, those seven episodes took roughly 100 hours, or sorry, 1,000 hours, uh, brainstorming, coming up with the original idea, interviewing, traveling, reporting, uh, lots of writing and editing, recording, and then the production process. Once you have everything down and then you got to put it together, that's, that's also really time consuming. And the total is about two hours of radio. So, um, you know, that's quite the ratio there. Um, but Two hours of radio makes uh, for a pretty good road trip if you want to want to binge binge the episodes. Um, audience. So one one of the things we did when when we were brainstorming for this series was talk about who is the intended audience for this series, and we really think it's anybody who has just a little bit of interest in um, science, conservation, the natural world here in the Upper Great Lakes. It could be folks like you who are from here, who live here. It could also be people living in other areas of the country, but have ties to the Great Lakes or, or find the Great Lakes uh, interesting. Another thing uh, we really wanted to stress was we want people of all different opinions to, to come to this series. Like this series is for, for everybody. Um, we just present sort of the, the story and then let you decide what you wanna think of them. So we really uh, think this is, a, this is a series for a lot of different people, people who might disagree on some things. Um, but you can see there, um, you know, whether outdoor enthusiasts, hunters, anglers, conservationists, land managers, we feel like this has something to offer everybody. Um, another uh, thing that was stressed during the production was how can we um, multiply our, our efforts to, to get the message, to get this series out here? We believe that this is some of the finest work um, Interlock and Public Radio has has produced. And so we want to get it out to the world. And so we were able to collaborate with a few different um, outdoor podcasts. Outside In is a big one. They're out of New Hampshire Public Radio. Um, we agreed to do an episode swap. So they played one of ours, we played one of theirs. That was really good um, exposure. Um, you may watch Great Lakes Now on Detroit Public Television. We were featured on uh, that program. And then uh, Michigan radio uh, through stateside, uh, you can hear 
this whole series, you, you possibly heard this whole series on, uh, on stateside. And then uh, what was really fun too, we, we broke out of the state and were featured on Minnesota Public Radio and then WXPR up in um, Eastern Wisconsin too. So again, we, we feel like this speaks to the high quality of the programming and um, it was fun to collaborate with these different media entities. What have we been up to now? <laughs> so a natural selection wrapped up earlier this spring. Um, and, and Patrick and I agree that it sort of set a new bar for Points North in terms of quality, production value, um, all of that. And so since then, we've been, we've been reporting on um, similar issues, really. Uh, you can see me right, right in the lower left-hand corner. This was a recent story I did about a secretive marsh bird called a rail. Um, it's pictured up there. They're these skinny birds. You might've heard of the phrase thin as a rail before. Some people think that's where that phrase came from because rails are very thin and, and they need to be thin to, to live in these dense marsh areas. Um, their habitat has been declining. Um, and so that has led to po their population also declining. And so what, um, what this researcher, Dustin Brewer, who I'm interviewing, what he was uh, re researching was how can we draw rails into newly restored wetland areas, areas that we know are gonna be stable, are gonna be good for these birds. They migrate at night, so they might not recognize what is good habitat below them. And so he has rigged up an audio playback site that plays rail calls. And what he wanted to find out was if playing rail calls, the birds would think, oh, there's other rails, we should go check it out um, and increase the population in the, this prime habitat. Um, he's still doing research on that, but preliminary data, the preliminary results show that yes, indeed it is playing a role. And so that was uh, a story and cool. Um, that story was featured on Science Friday recently, which was which was also a real thrill to be on and, and talk about again this this reporting. We'll let Patrick share next. Yeah. Uh, so in the middle, that's me talking with a ecologist who studies bats named Brianna Gusick, and we are in an abandoned mine in the in the Keweenaw Peninsula, and uh, that's one of many many areas across the country that has been impacted by white nose syndrome. You can see a bat with white nose syndrome on the right, and that's a fungal infection that has caused a lot of bats to go on the endangered species list. And what it does is it disturbs the bats' hibernation. It, it wakes them up. And when they emerge from the cave, then they're weaker because they spent a lot of the energy warming their body back up then going to sleep and doing it again. So when they come out, they're weak. And a lot of times the actual cause of death is starvation. Um, so what they're trying to do is use these ultraviolet lights outside of the cave, right when the bats emerge, to bring in bugs so that right when the bats come out, there's just a cluster of bugs for them to feed on. They're calling it a bug buffet. And I learned that the little brown bat, which is one of the most, well, used to be one of the most dominant species of bats in the region, can eat a thousand mosquitoes in an hour. Um, maybe it was in a single night. Can't remember the exact detail. But the point is they eat a lot of mosquitoes. And when bats decline, you get a lot more buggy summers. So that's a personal interest in <laughs> keeping them around, but also a really interesting and innovative way to see if maybe they can strengthen the population when they are affected by this disease. Um, want to talk about muscles, Stan? Yeah. So some upcoming episodes that we have in the works um, have to do with invasive muscles in the Great Lakes, which I'm sure you're all aware of. But um, what are scientists and researchers trying to do to combat the problem? It's you know, the muscle population continues to, to grow. And so an upcoming episode is going to deal with um, this, this experiment. It's been tested on a much smaller scale, but this experiment of an acre big tarp, uh, a tarp the size of an acre being placed on the bottom of the lake, lake bed. And that, what that would do is it would cut off the muscles from receiving light and nutrients. And so this could possibly be used to, you know, be put over um, breeding beds where these muscles breed and where they reproduce. And so maybe that's a way of cutting off some of the, the population and making a dent in, in the uh, number of muscles in the Great Lakes. But that episode's coming out in a few weeks here, but in the works. Yeah, and then the episode I'm working on right now uh, should air next Friday, and it's in the bottom 
center is the picture and does anyone know what animal that is he's got it it kind of looks like an elk it is a caribou until two weeks ago i had no idea there were any caribou left in the upper great lakes it turns out there is one herd of caribou on the far northern shore of lake superior in ontario and there are a lot of questions about when to intervene to help keep them around or if this is a natural process and they're going to not be in this area anymore and the real question is a lot of people blame climate change on the species decline, but caribou have survived through rapid changes in climate through a long, long history. So what's the real reason that they're not persisting in the upper Great Lakes anymore? They used to be the most dominant animal in the deer family in this region too, which I didn't know either. Um, and so in 2014, there was a polar vortex. Lake Superior froze almost entirely over, which is pretty rare. And caribou walked out to an island far into the lake and so did a few wolves. And then the ice went out and their numbers started dropping really fast. And scientists in Ontario were left with this dilemma of, do we, do we get involved? Do we intervene? And I won't spoil it, but I'm in the throes of that right now. I have my second edit tomorrow. Uh, so yeah, stay tuned for that one next Friday. And if you're wondering where you can hear these episodes, again, they do play every other Friday on uh, our All Things Considered and or during Morning Edition and All Things Considered. But a great way that really helps us if you listen this way as well is if you subscribe to or follow the podcast Points North. And if you have an iPhone, you can do that on Apple Podcasts. That app's built into your phone. If you have an Android, it's Google Podcasts, or you can do it on Spotify. And what that does for us, even if you do tune in on the radio, which I like doing as well to shows I enjoy, but when you subscribe to the podcast, it helps more people find it. It helps other podcasts be more willing to collaborate and get the stories out there. And ultimately, it helps us to be able to keep telling these stories and bringing them to you. So it really does mean a lot to us if you do subscribe to the show. And we have some free postcards back there that are really cool. Dan took the pictures on them. And if you fill it out and address it to someone you want to tell about the podcast, we'll stamp it and mail it for you. So we really want to get the word out and get our numbers up on the digital platforms, because these days that's a really important way to spread the word about the work we're doing. And all you got to do is open up those apps and search Points North. And that's the logo you're looking for. That's our show. So, yeah. Any any questions from anybody? About any of the episodes? About anything. anything yeah. Else? yeah. There we go. <laughs> hey, you got it. It's, it's subscribing. <laughs> nice. Any any questions? Yeah. 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 So. Yep. Yeah. So, um, Richard Norton, the the University of Michigan professor, he it was really interesting. He he talked to me a little bit about this. Um, he said before really World War II, we viewed the lake as a way to get materials up and down to different cities. It was it was in after World War II that we started to interact and think of it as like an aesthetic and and started building closer to the to the water. And um yeah, just just being there year round even. And so yeah, after World War II, the mind mindset started to shift and and so you know, not houses that weren't that big, but we started to build on and live and interact with the lake differently. Yeah, it's a good question. Anybody else? I, I, I will say that you call the sound rich narrative. Yeah, yep. And I just want to applaud your use of sound. I, I noticed even in the little ad piece that you did for the night. Yeah. You were in the car and I just took note of you had the background noise of the car running. And yeah. In the piece, the ramping up of the heavy music. I was like, I hear you driving away. <laughs> And I, I just kind of like that. I also noticed in uh, the sound effect of the clips uh-huh. of the water. Yeah. Um, made it richer. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that you mentioned the thousand hours and two hours. But. Yeah. So anybody watching this later, he's 
talking about the sound richness of, of the episodes. And that is something that we really um, were intentional about because I, I don't know, I, I love radio for that reason. You can transport people uh, just by giving them a little sound and then they engage more deeply than they would other mediums with their imagination. And so for me, that's always been a, a big part of, of radio is bring them there, bring the listener to that spot, to that location so they can feel it and, and uh, you know, experience it themselves. So thanks for appreciating that. <laughs> thanks, yeah. 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 So I don't know for sure if there's a distinction, if it's just muscles at this point. Yeah. Um, but I, I have heard about the gobies um, and I don't know that that's, that's a solution to really curb the, the numbers in a, in a big way. Yeah. 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 Huh. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've done some looking into studies that look at how gobies will eat the I can't remember the name for it, but basically the larvae of the muscles, the really young muscles that haven't solidified yet, they'll feed on that. But when there's a really established bed of muscles on the lake bed, that's just kind of there. And so they're like you might have mentioned, they're experimenting with putting this big tarp over the yeah. muscles to block out the sun and just see what that does. There's a lot of different there's manual removal that you can do, and then the gobies might keep back the muscles from recolonizing, but of course, to manually remove muscles from the entire lake bed of the Great Lakes is very impractical. So, you know, yeah, yeah, that's a that's part of yeah, interaction totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although Patrick said there might not be a ton of living stuff at the bottom. I mean, there have been other small prey fish that have already impacted that layer of the lake in so many ways that I'm just wondering if researchers aren't thinking about cutting their losses and getting a fresh start of sorts on the lake bed. But I'm not sure. These are all when to intervene, when not to intervene. Those are all the kinds of questions that we're really interested in. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Good, good thoughts. I think yeah. we have a, actually a freelancer working on yep. on that story, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, excited to see how that goes. We're getting some interest from other people to help make stories in Points North. And yeah, you can always pitch a story idea. You can always yeah. uh, send an idea to us. Or yeah. Well, thank you guys for for yeah. For a comment and a question. Yeah. Like, Oh wow. Lot, okay. Uh, in the area of the West End Beach. Uh, yeah. Lot. Okay. And as as uh, twelve different five stages have collapsed into Lake Michigan. Yeah. And we have decided not to rebuild it just as it was. Hmm. To look at, look at moving the hardened edge uh, further back. Yeah. We'll have to have some edge there because there's a drain parkway and other infrastructure. Right. But if we can have that hardening further away from Lake Michigan, one, uh, it makes it a more natural shoreline, and two, the lake will continue to go up and down, mm -hmm. and the uh, further lake hardening is away from the shoreline, uh, the more, the less likely it will be to collapse the next time the lake comes up. Yeah, that's that's exciting to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so, um, I'm sure. This year, the lights have to go back in February. Yeah, street, yeah, um, yeah, California. Yeah, and two weeks ago, there was uh, a marketplace episode on 
I manage the fees, I don't know that. Yeah. But yeah. it all conforms to the situation. Yeah. Right? Well, uh, thanks for listening, Mitch. Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have one more thing we want to do before we wrap up. And, and again, uh, feel free, if you have any questions, we're here to chat afterwards. We'd love to meet you and, and chat with you. But we're going to do a, a raffle. And so I'm hoping as you walked in, you filled, filled out a, um, a little slip of paper because we're going to raffle off, raffle off a couple hats. Um, and so did, did everybody get a chance to fill out? It's a signature interlock in blue corduroy, just just like the pants. Blue corduroy hat looks really sharp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We actually cut up some pants to make these. Hats. No, we didn't. Are they old heavy uh, guard bags? Yeah. yeah. Nice, nice. Yeah, that are there risks or or gathering spaces or whatever spaces or whatever it might be. People don't know this exists, but we're totally definitely. I've definitely tried to share it with people. I yeah, yeah, with. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good question. Though. Yeah, I'm just thinking about in all of the schools and you know around the country, it's different programs. Who I mean, I think we see it in the curriculum, but for the rest, hmm. for some of us classes. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah, good idea. Yeah. Like you said, it's exploring the questions, not necessarily us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I think Mitch is done. We'll do the raffle here. Patrick, you want to do the raffle? Sure. Yeah. Get a drum roll or something. There we go. <laughs> All right. First lucky winner Barb Mendenhall. Barb. There we go. Congrats. IPR hat. Your odds are pretty good in here. Hat number two. Hat number two. Uh oh, I grabbed two. I'm going to go with this one. And it's empty. It's good. Oh. Le Leah Bacchus. No. No. Well, We'll have to. Uh, we'll send an email. Maybe, maybe hi, present to win. <laughs> have to be present to win. Yeah. And another winner. Another Mendenhall. This is Ernie Mendenhall. You guys, <laughs> you guys can have matching hats. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. You have it. All right. Thirty-three point three percent chance of winning now. <laughs> And it goes to Lynn Bryant. There you, right. go. you got it after all. Thanks for coming out, you guys. Yeah. Thanks for a great program. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. And we got free stickers.